This is the Become the Lion podcast. If you are aiming to become the top in your industry, not second, not above average, the top, then you have come to the right place. Become the Lion will provide you with weekly insights and motivation needed from our guests on how to escape the common herd that society lives in. If you're looking to change your life, then get ready. Welcome to Become the Lion. From Become the Lion, and today on the show, we have David Osborne. David was broke and unemployed at 26. Now he's the co-owner of the 20th largest real estate company in the United States, doing more than $5.2 billion in sales in 2015. David is the author of Wealth Can't Wait. He exemplifies why being wealthy is more than just having money. David, welcome to Become the Lion. Thanks, Trevor. It's great to be with you. David, how did you get started in entrepreneurship? Well, Trevor, I was one of those uh, lawnmower kids, you know, so I was I was into working early on. I wasn't a great student. I didn't find school that satisfying. I was a little bit uh, uh, uppity at school, you might say. I talked back a lot, probably more than I should have, and but uh, when I got a job and I realized that I could just work and get a paycheck, there was something very liberating for me in that experience. And so quite early on, I was a, a bagger, a grocery bagger, and I thought that was killer. I would think I was 15 and I was making, you know, whatever, $3.25 an hour, but I tried to be the fastest bagger in the store. Um, I got fired from that job actually for, uh, for insolence to the manager, and I was shocked he fired me because I was the fastest bagger in the store, but I guess... Uh, Speaking back is not always a good thing. And then um, I, I, a buddy of mine had a landscaping company. I went to work for him for a little bit. And then when I, that was when I was 16, one summer just kind of working where I was digging holes and carrying wheelbarrows and stuff around. And then I just thought, wow, I could, I could cut yards. A friend of mine was making a ton of money cutting yards, so I just bought a truck and a lawnmower and started cutting yards. So early on, I think I was 17 years old, I made $20,000, and this was a few years ago, so it was pretty good money. That's about as rich as I've ever felt, living at home, no payments, and just $20,000 cash. It was pretty sweet. And what's your journey been like from the moment you know, where you're doing all these little jobs, so now you, you, know, you own the 20th largest real estate company in the United States? How did that all come about? So after working uh, with my lawn mowing business for a couple of years, I actually built it up to three trucks and we were doing plumbing and some basic elementary handyman work. Um, as I graduated high school, my old man said, look, it's college Marines or you're on your own. And I chose college. So I went to college and I did, I did pretty poorly again as a, as, a t- as a student there, but I was always working. I managed to graduate with a degree with a 2.3 GPA. And then uh, I went uh, went to work for a sales company, and it was basically selling computer systems, one of the hardest jobs I've ever had. I would walk into a skyscraper, and I would just knock on all the doors of every business and shoot right by that no solicitation sign and go right up to the secretary. And I had about you know 1.3 seconds to make her laugh or make her like me, say something nice about him or her. It was, and uh, I had that I had that moment, uh, you know, like, oh, my gosh, that is such a beautiful dress. Hey, by the way, who's in charge of acquisitions in this company? So that was kind of the process. Um, that was a fun job. I did pretty well at it. I became one of the top two salespeople in the company. And uh, and then at the end of one year doing that, um, again, I had a conflict with my boss. And uh, my best friend was one year behind me, and he said, hey, I'm going to go hitchhike around the world for a year. Do you want to go? And I, I told him, you're crazy. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to work. But after a year with another conflict with another boss, I went ahead and told him, hey, I'm going to quit this job. Uh, let's do it. Sold all my money, sold all my car, sold everything. And I had, uh, I had uh, $10,000 to my name. That was my entire net worth. And uh, I sold everything, bought a $3,000 around-the-world ticket, and went hitchhiking around the world for a year with my best bud. But even then, hitchhiking around the world is still very entrepreneurial. We didn't know where we were going to start that day. We didn't know where we were going to end at the end of the day. We often had to uh, meet people. They'd let us sleep on their couches. We were just kind of bumming our way around the world. And then we bought a bunch of bandanas from America because we'd heard that in Africa they didn't have uh, uh, clothing. We weren't completely accurate on that. We'd have been smarter to bring T-shirts, but we hit the beach of Malawi, and we were trading for uh, necklaces and, and uh, uh, earrings of ebony. It's a uh, wood over there. And we were, we were trading our bandanas, and really they wanted our socks and our underwear more than the bandanas. But anyway, we still did some trades, and then we took our, our jewelry up and tried to sell it in Australia and Europe and different places. And so there was a lot of entrepreneurial activity there going on. 
so I kind of got in it early. I was just kind of in my blood, I guess. Um, and then when I came back from hitchhiking around the world, I was in, I was pretty broke. It had been two years instead of one. Uh, I was minus three thousand in credit card debt. So you can actually be minus in life, which people don't realize. You know, it's not like there's a floor. There's a sub floor as well. Um, but I was uh, two, I was twenty six years old, and and my mom was a real estate agent, and I went and got a, another job in technology sales. But again, right even before I started, they had me sign an intellectual agreement that anything I dreamed of or thought of or you know made up while I was working for the company would belong to them. And even though I'd gotten the job and passed all the interviews, I quit like the same day. I'm like, I, I can't work under this kind of condition. I just wasn't up for it. I felt liberated, felt amazing as I walked out that door. For about 24 hours, I had a high, and then I, you know, because I was like, the man's not going to control me. And then I realized I was dead broke, had no money, and had credit card debt. So. My mom was a real estate agent. She said, why don't you come work for me temporarily while you look for a real job? And I said, okay, I'll come, I'll come work with you. But just keep in mind, I'm not staying in real estate. I, don't, I, I want to find a real job. And uh, fell in love with the business, sold a couple of houses, uh, made money. I thought, man, this is pretty easy. You just got to drive someone around, help them find what they're looking for, and you get paid. And it, it was really fun. Uh, the hardest part about real estate, I realized, was finding the buyers and sellers. Uh, that once you had them, it was quite easy. You just got to take care of them. You know, do what needs to be done. That's pretty straightforward. Um, but after about three years of doing that, I happened to be with the fastest growing real estate company, pretty much in the world, Keller Williams. At the time, I think there was less than a thousand agents. Today, there's 150 thousand. And um, I just started looking for the next opportunity. And the next opportunity was start opening franchises. So that's what we did. We started buying franchises. And um, ultimately became the largest franchise owner in the company. Um, but it was just a process of what's next, what's next, what's next. Really, for me, like I, I, I loved serving people. But when I was driving the same, you know, the, the, a third buyer on the same day down the same street saying the same thing, after three years, I was like, you know, I don't think this is going to work for me. I need to do something slightly different. And that's when, you know, Gary Keller and Mo Anderson, who were the, the chairman and the founder and the CEO at the time of the company, uh, they were like, hey, we're looking for people to own franchises. Um, why don't you guys go look at North Texas? So we did. And from there, it was just a whirlwind. And that's what's brought me up to today to the – actually, the you know, the, we just merged with another company. So now we should be around the 10th largest real estate company in the U.S. And as you're growing, you know, as you're buying the franchises and as you're growing the company, what were some of the challenges that you had to overcome? You know, the first one would be, I mean, the most significant challenge I had was about three years into it, I effectively had what felt like a nervous breakdown. And ultimately what I was doing is, you know, I'd worked, what I realized in sales is you could just grind it out. So you could work as hard and as unlimited as you want. And the harder you work, the more money you made. And I think that's one of the great things about being an entrepreneur. There's no limit to how hard you can work. The hours I mean, especially when you're in your 20s, you can put in 16-hour days, 17-hour days, 18-hour days, whatever it takes. So I was doing that, and I was having some good success with it. I used to compete with a buddy on how many hours we worked each day, and whether it was 12 hours, 14 hours, whatever it was, and then how few days we would take off. So we're just kind of grinding. And uh, then when I got up to Dallas and I started opening franchises, I began to realize there was a flaw in, in my thinking because when you open a franchise, it's not really about how hard you work. It's how it really becomes about how good the team is that you put together. And that's a pretty big transition. So, you know, I was fixing cubicles. I was uh, building computers. I was recruiting the talent for the company. I was just pretty much doing everything I could. And one day I woke up with like a, a pain on my chest and it turned out it was shingles from stress. It was like a recurrence of chicken pox. So I went to the doctor. He's like, you know, I don't know how you have this at 29 years old, but most people don't get this stuff until they're in their 50s. Uh, it was very, very painful. So it was like I, my life was kind of spiraling a little bit. You wouldn't have noticed it from the outside because I was just grinding away, still having my appointments. But I was in a lot of physical pain and I was not really – fully present. Um, but at that time, I had a lot of mentors around me. I had coaches. Um, I was getting coached by Gary Keller, who will be a billionaire. So I was getting mentored by a billionaire. And I put, I put some of his lessons in my book. But uh, ultimately, what I began to learn is it's not about just grinding. grinding. Grinding will get you to a point in life. And it's very important that you have the ability and the willingness to work hard. But really, working smart is even more important. And, and so for me, what I learned through that process was you know, I took a course by a guy. He said, look, just do the three most important things every day. Write down every day 10 things and do the three most important, then that's it. And if you do that, you'll be massively successful. And in the past, I'd kind of treated everything equally. So if a guy called me to sell me insurance, 
and also a potential recruit for my office called, I would return those calls in the order they came in. Meaning if the insurance guy called, I'd call him back first and let him, you know, sell me on insurance. And then I, I get to the realtor if I, you know, the recruit, if I had still got time in my day. And what I learned after that course is just blow off all the B and C priorities and just focus relentlessly on the A's. And amazingly, what happened is I started having more fun getting more results and working less. So the breakthrough of just doing the most important thing every day, and that's what I do to this day, transformed my life. And within a year after that, I was having much better results. I was able to leverage through other people. I was able to build a bigger business. And I specifically would just blow off the B and C. For a while there, I would teach classes. I'd say, listen, if I don't call you back, you're just a B or C priority for me. Nothing personal. I'm just very driven. I'm focused on my outcomes. And so therefore, I do the A priorities only. And uh, it was a big breakthrough for me. And it was, it was quite painful. But it was really the pain of not being the right person, not approaching life the right way for the amount of pressure and stress I was under. And once I was willing to break down to have a breakthrough uh, and change that habit, then I started getting huge, much, much better results. And to this day, I just do the most important stuff. So if, if I'm writing my list of to-dos and there's one thing that I get that kind of, oh, I don't really want to do that, that's the thing I go for first. If it's a activity that will generate an outcome, not if it's irrelevant. If it's irrelevant and it's an uh, then I just ignore it. But if it's like, oh, man, I don't want to call that guy. There could be a conflict there. I immediately make that phone call. So it's just a habit, and it's a habit that I have that memory of that pain from the shingle. So it's very easy for me to follow through. The pain of not doing things is far greater for me than the pain of uh, a little bit of potential discomfort from making an uncomfortable phone call or anything like that. To me, it really seems like you're showing the difference between what a busy person is and what a productive person is. That's a really good distinction. Do you happen to just set up like boundaries in your life? You know, I'm pretty hard to get to. I do have boundaries. Um, I have a clear plan for every year. I'm very, very goal focused. And that's a, another learning that I had. But I have, you know, my, my right hand man, you know, Matt King, who looks after me and protects me. Uh, he pretty much is the first input for everything. He knows what my goals are and what I'm trying to achieve. And you can't get through Matt. Um, you know, if you're wasting our time, we try to respond to everybody, but we definitely do not, uh, respond. We respond, but we do not react for everybody. So yes, we have boundaries and my boundary is just to keep focused on what's important to me. So when I'm working, I want to be extremely focused on the outcomes that we're trying to generate. I sit on a lot of boards for charities. When I'm, when I decide to join a charity, I'm all in for that charity. And I really concentrate on delivering the mission of that of that charity. And then when I'm with my family, I try to be fully present to my family, disconnect from work and, and be in that moment. So in each of those different moments, that's where I'll be. And if somebody's coming at me from left field, we might respond and say, you know, thanks for your offer, but we're not interested. So we try not to leave anybody hanging out of politeness, but we are very focused on what we're trying to achieve. Do you think being goal focused has allowed you to become more successful? There's no question. I'm an avid goal setter, setter, uh, goal setter. I don't know that everybody you know, what works for me, I don't think you'll find a more goal-driven person. I've, I have yet to meet someone that's more goal-driven than me. So every year I sit down and I write out about 60 or 70 goals in eight gardens. I call it the eight gardens of life. Um, and, and then that becomes my mantra. I read those every week at least once, sometimes twice or three times. I try to make sure I've viewed them at least 50 times a year. Um, and then I just imprint that in my subconscious and I execute towards that goal. And not only that, my, my Matt knows them, my family knows them, I post them up on the wall. They're just very uh, in front of me. And because of that, I nail 70, 80% of whatever I set out to do each year. And that's a massive amount. I mean, when I started goal setting, I was maybe hitting 20%, 25%. And I had a fewer number of goals. And now I'm, I'm hitting 70, 80%. And I have some pretty amazing things on my goal list, including every year taking my family on an epic, unforgettable vacation, including giving away a large amount of money every year to charity um, and just doing a lot of things in, in the seven, in the eight gardens of life. When you set your goals, do you set goals that are just above your reach or do you set goals that are really high and that just force you to grow into them? I do both. I make sure I have some big, hairy, audacious goals every year on my list. So I really try to challenge myself. But I also have certain ones that are pretty straightforward. Uh, 240 workouts a year, for instance. Like I used to not work out that much. I wasn't an athlete in high school. I was never a great athlete. I wasn't a terrible one era either. I was just kind of middle of the pack. If, if kids were getting picked on the playground, I was somewhere in the middle. So, uh, but working out is a pr pretty easy thing to do, right? So 240 workouts a year, which is five a week for me, keeps me active, keeps me physically strong. That's, I would consider that a pretty easy one. 
Um, and then on the other hand, yes, I'll also put some, some pretty challenging goals. Like this year, I want my entire family to learn Spanish. Uh, not necessarily fluently, but we're using Duolingo and different strategies to learn Spanish. Uh, so, so hard, you know, that's not easy to do. My daughter doesn't speak Spanish. My wife doesn't speak Spanish. I have a smattering of Spanish enough to get around and order beer and, you know, find my way to a hotel. So that's kind of a bigger goal. And that's an example of one that's a little more challenging. So I do both. I like to have the easy wins. I think in life, you've got to give yourself some easy wins as well as some extreme challenges. Um, and I think that's how you build momentum and success. If you set anything too high and the challenge is only too high and you're, you're, you, you reach a lot of failure, you're, you're likely to get discouraged and quit. That's just human nature. If you set it way too easy, you're going to get bored and quit. So that's another you know, weakness. If you get it right in that sweet spot um, where you're challenging yourself to stretch and grow a little more than you would without it, but not so hard that you quit or not so easy that you get bored, uh, that's the sweet spot for all goal setting. When you set your goals and then you accomplish the goal that you set out for yourself, do you have a little bit of a celebration for yourself? You know, I, I'm pretty good at, at just having a great time in life now. I used to be a lot worse, and, and there's definitely that part of us that um, you know tends to look forward, not backwards. Uh, celebration, I think, is very important. It's something I coach to, and I'll, and sometimes I fall short of, of celebrating, celebrating myself. I, have you ever heard of the term the gap, which is something I was taught by Dan Sullivan, but he said people set these goals, and you know, so you draw a line at, say, on a scale of 1 to 10 at 10, and then they achieve to an 8, 8 out of the 10, and instead of focusing on the 8 they achieved, they look at the gap between the 8 and the 10, and they're like, dang, I fell short, and they beat themselves up. And that's not really a productive or fulfilling life. You're not, you wouldn't want your kid to walk around in a funk beating themselves up for only reading 80, reaching 80% of their life dreams. So at the end of the day, um, I do try to celebrate. I definitely spend a lot more time enjoying life than I used to when I was grinding it out in my 20s. And the way I do that is by making sure I have four family vacations a year, one epic one and then three smaller ones. So I book those right at the beginning of the year and just make sure I'm taking time to appreciate and celebrating you know, the success I've had and not just being like some... Uh, you know, you climb the mountain, you get to the top, you need to celebrate that mountain, not immediately look at the next mountain and go like, let's go climb that one and hurry up. Let's get going, pick up your stuff. Let's go. You want to actually, you know, uh, celebrate that success. So yes, it's a, it's a thing I, I, I believe in and sometimes I'm good at it and sometimes I'm not. Uh, David, I want to talk about your book, Wealth Can't Wait. Do you mind explaining a little bit about it to our audience? Love to. My dad was dying of cancer. My dad was a Green Beret, uh, and he got cancer a couple years ago. Let's see, now seven, uh, actually now 10 years ago. So he died seven years ago. And while he was dying, I was, you know, and I was at the time, uh, you know, just turning 40. And I thought to myself, I, you know, if, if, if he, if he leaves, you know, I'm trying to get all the stories from him and remember him. And he, he had a lot of really cool stories like from Vietnam and from his childhood, and I thought, man, if, if I died tomorrow, you know, I got a young kid, she won't know anything about me. So um, so it kind of inspired me, like, what would I want to leave behind? What message would I want to leave behind? And and not a message like an autobiography of, oh, I was born over here and I did this and I hitchhiked around the world, but more like what lessons have served me? Because I really love my life and I feel very lucky to have the life I have. I feel lucky to have the friends I have. And I feel really blessed economically and financially. But I will tell you that the that, that, that I didn't get here by accident. It wasn't uh, just like I was suddenly woke up successful. I've paid a price for my success, and the price has been being authentic, being honest, looking at myself in the mirror, asking myself continually what's working, what's not working, and then, and then adjusting. So being self-made, being self-developed um, has been a, a, an expensive price, but a very, very well worthwhile price. So I thought, could I write down a book on some of the lessons that I've learned that have helped me achieve this life that I think is truly a really great, blessed life and, um, and leave it so that my kids could read it and understand it. And that's where I came from. And I started that journey on this book while my dad was dying of cancer now, eight, seven, eight years ago. It's been one of the hardest things I've ever done, Trevor, because as, as you may have remembered from my earlier story, I wasn't a great student. It's not like homework's what I want to do. Uh, the idea of creating the book was awesome, but then writing it was just a beating. I probably made every mistake you could possibly make, which isn't that uncommon for me. Sometimes I do make a lot of mistakes, and and then I adjusted, and I got a better team, and I built it. So finally, we have the book out, and uh, it's it's being released in April, but it's just a fabulous 
accomplishment. I'm very, very glad it's done. And I'm really glad that when I read it, I feel like it's a, a, a good book that has a lot of good lessons in it. So, so that's what we hit on is just the concept of what it takes to be wealthy. And the original word wealth doesn't come from just money. It comes from, they used to say it in the 13th century, like welly be with you, like a we- good welly to you. And it meant health, wealth, and providence. In fact, the word health and wealth are obviously only one letter apart, but they're very linked. And so they used to say good hail to you as well, which was a health thing. So when we talk about wealth, we're talking about really like the total package, like abundance, prosperity, relationship, everything. And so we go into it. What does it take to be wealthy? And we start with, you know, the commitment. It starts with a mindset. But more than everything else, wealth is a mindset, which is why athletes win all that money and end up broke, you know, because they don't have the mindset of wealth. So it's a choice, a mindset. Uh, you got to avoid sort of the wealth traps. We list out seven wealth traps that prevent people from making money. Um, and then we talk about the habits. Okay, so now you've you've made the decision. That's really it. Starts with a decision. And then like, what mentally do you have to be to like if you if you're uh, given fifty million dollars like so many athletes? What mental state do you have not to blow it? Or as you build even a thousand dollars, what mental state do you have to have not to blow it? We hit that up. And then the habits that you need to establish that just become automatic, like one I told you about, which is making the tough call. Just don't. If there's a minute, if you're thinking, man, that guy might be getting mad at me, or I should. That, 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 that needs to be done, or I need to address that with that employee, whatever it is. You know, many, many people avoid that. Instead, you should say, okay, that's a sign from inside that I got to go address that issue. I need to talk to that employee right now about the quality of this work, because if I don't address it right now, it's only going to get worse and create friction. And either the talk will lead to a breakthrough or a breakup, but the avoidance of that conversation is far worse than not facing it head on. So that's an example of one of the habits we've got also then the pillars, there's seven pillars that you use to build a business that builds wealth for you. And then finally, once you start achieving a little success, a lot of people find it like a roller coaster with ups and downs. And we list out some strategies and tactics you can use to maintain the momentum that you need once you get to the top. Life's all about momentum. Working out is like momentum. Making your phone calls is like momentum. Financial success is momentum. I look at more business deals this year. I look at more in 2016 than I did for the entire my in my entire decade of my 30s, right? So I've got so much momentum in the deal space now that we're looking at hundreds of deals on an annual basis, eliminating almost all of them and then choosing the ones to invest in. But in my 30s, I would say, you know, I, I probably did 100 in my entire 30s and now I'm doing hundreds every year. And that's just an example of the momentum. Working out could be another momentum. Taking the vacations. I never took vacations in my 20s. I just worked. That's all I did. Uh, maybe got one good one in a year because I still, I always like the adventure travel but today, just the, again, building in that family time, building in those killer vacations so you're making memories. The workouts is another one. Like I've got good momentum around my workouts. And when I drop the ball or fizzle out a little bit, I hire a trainer. I've got those built into my schedule. So I've got a way to establish and maintain momentum because once you get to the top, it's not like you just stay there. you got to keep rolling it forward. And so we put a lot of those techniques in there. And then the last thing we offer in the appendix is a life audit. And I'm really big on this, Trevor, like to know where you want to go. If I called you and said, hey, how do I get to your house? What's the first thing you'd say to me? I'd probably, I'd probably give you like ask if you have a GPS or something like that. That'd be a good answer. But the, you'd, you'd, yeah, that, today's world, you'd say, in the old days, you'd say, where are you? Because right? you can't tell me how to get you. Are you coming from the north or the south? Are you in South Austin or are you in North Austin? Because right? <clears throat> you can't know where you want. You can't get to where you want to go unless you know where you are. So we're very, So we have something called a life audit tool. And it's, it's just a way of really kind of slapping yourself in the face or, you know, let's put cold water on yourself and just say, where am I today? Because if you think everything's great and you're spending 120 cents of every dollar you bring in, it's not great. You got to look at that, see what it is and adjust your behavior. And the, the willingness to change yourself is what's going to lead to the biggest outcome in life. In fact, your life is pretty much a reflection of who you are today and how you think today. And if you want to change your circumstances, you've got to change your perspective and how you think and how you act. And that's not easy, but it is the most rewarding journey of all. If you want to be a better father, you've got to learn the tools to be a better father. If you want to have better physical shape, you've got to learn the habits, the behaviors of people that get into different shape. And if you want to be successful in business, you've got to learn the habits people use to do business. And it's really challenging, but it's amazingly fun, that internal journey, because it truly is the path of a warrior. It's the path of somebody choosing their destiny as opposed to having their destiny given to them by random circumstances. And so that life audit sort of 
wakes you up. We have a, something called the Life Happiness Index. You measure yourself in 20 different areas and say, how am I doing, how happy I am. We have an economic audit. Um, and then with that life audit, you get to really look at what's working and what's not and start building and designing your life for the future. So it's it's been fun writing it. I'm really, really pleased with it. If I got hit by a bus tomorrow, you know, I have a three-month-old boy. Uh, he could pick this up at some point. And, uh, if you just follow these strategies, you're going to win in life. And that's really all I could ask for. Do you think most people aren't wealthy? Strictly he's talking about money. Is it because of their mindset? I think it's 100% mindset, 99.9%. Now, there are circumstances. You can win the lottery. You could marry a wealthy person. Uh, you could be born into significant wealth. And those things can affect whether you're – you could be born into poverty. But I think far more important is your state of mind. The reason poor people become wealthy is because they have the right state of mind. And the reason wealthy people lose everything uh, is because they have the wrong state of mind. So if you read the book um, – uh, how to Be Rich uh, by Felix Dennis, I think it's called. He talks about how wealth is first and foremost a state of mind. And this is a guy that was worth 300 million pounds. I think he died in England a couple years ago, but um, he built a bunch of trade magazines. But the bottom line is it is absolutely a state of mind. And if you get the right state of mind, you'll win. And if you have the wrong state of mind, you'll lose. Uh, you may blame the world and say, no, it's, he can't be right. It's not, it's not me. It's somebody else. But the reality is it is you. Do you think anyone – can become wealthy, you know, making ordinary income, which is some, you know, a salary or a job. Or do you think to become wealthy, you have to find ways to make passive income? You have to find okay. So you can use your average everyday wealth to be somewhat successful. I know guys that are cops. I know guys that are engineers that have taken their pass their money and bought rental property, for instance, and paid it off. And they're they're rich. They're not wealthy, but they're well off. So they don't have to work. They might have ten thousand a month coming in and passive. So you can do that with a regular job. It still requires that action and that uh, you know willingness to take risk because I don't think you get there at eight percent return on the stock market historically. You get there by adding in some sweat equity, adding in some brains, and 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 a little bit of luck. But I think to have really significant wealth, you can keep that regular job, but you need to have that eBay business on the side, or you need to have a uh, rental re- rehabbing properties on the side, or you need to have something where you're using your sweat, your wits, your 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 brains and your work ethic to expand and increase your wealth. Uh, I don't think you get rich just by earning 50000 or $75,000 a year for 30 years. And as you're making this money and as you, you're growing your income, is it important to live below your means? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so the habits of early on are to live below your income because it's called capitalism for a reason. You make capital, you have capital, and you can earn a return on that capital, and that's how you get financially free. That's really the best economic opportunity the world has to offer. And by the way, if you're in, in China or if you're in Russia or if you're in you know, Venezuela, it's 10 times harder than we have in America. So it's never easy to build wealth through capitalism, but we are in the best country in the world for that to happen. There's just no question. So – so you want to live below your means, so you build capital because that capital can be invested and made or make a rate of return. I don't think of ten dollars, Trevor, as ten dollars. I think of ten dollars as one dollar a year for the rest of my life. That's how I think of all money. So if I got ten thousand dollars, it's a thousand a year for the rest of my life. So anytime you're buying, you know, like a, if you're buying a fifty thousand dollar car and you could have lived with a twenty five thousand dollar car, well, that twenty five grand that you just blew on that nice car is is the equivalent of two thousand five hundred a year for the rest of your life. So that's what you just blew. You just blew 2,500 years for like 60 years. So it's a, a $250,000 loss by blowing that 25000 bucks. Now, the thing about it, Trevor, is, is that will only take you so far. So that's the mindset you need to come in with for the first 10 years of wealth building or 15 years of wealth building. But then at some point, you, know, you cannot get rich by cutting your expenses to zero. You know, If you're spending zero but you're earning zero, you're still at zero. So, so it's, again, one of those evolutionary things as you start getting – more successful and you start hitting a higher and higher number, you still always want to earn more than you spend, but it's okay to live life and enjoy life and have a good lifestyle. I'm, I'm not a fan of, you know, I make, you know, people, there, there's rich and wealthy and some people uh, have, have good income and have good money, but truly wealthy people, you need to enjoy life as well. And that comes, that's kind of like your reward later. It's like you talked about earlier. Do you celebrate? Well, if you, if you make a million bucks a year and you're still living on 75, you're actually just a cheapskate. You know, you're not really enjoying life. On the other hand, if you make 75 and you're spending 110, you're an idiot, right? So at the end of the day, you've got to find that balance. And the evolution of the journey is uh, sacrifice 
sacrifice, sacrifice, build, build, build wealth, and then at some point, hopefully, turn around and celebrate it, enjoy it, enjoy it on your family and yourself, and then ultimately give it away. Like I think, uh, you know, I think Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have that thing figured out. You you earn it, and then ultimately, you want to give it back to some cause, uh, something that matters to you. And so I, th- I do think that's the journey. Why do you think that some people view wealthy people in like a negative light? I think it's programming. I think uh, there's a lot of negativity, whether it's the movie Wall Street, which I actually kind of enjoyed. But if you think about it, greed is good. Gordon Gecko is not a flattering looking person. Um, you know, you see what goes on in the why, you know, in, in 2008 with all the, the crashing of the banks. And you see a lot of greedy people kind of messed up the economy for everybody else. There's no question about that. So I think that's the mindset. And if you have that mindset, then you have a perfect excuse never to make an effort. If you think all rich people are jerks and rich people are you know, just not nice people, and uh, then you've got a perfect excuse never try to build wealth. Now, my personal experience, like I know a lot of really wealthy people. And when I say that, I'm talking about 100 million plus people. Um, and I even know a, a guy that's destined to be a billionaire, whether he is or not. I, I wrote about him in the book, but – but everyone I know that's super wealthy does a tremendous amount for other people, like a massive amount. I know a guy in Austin who's trying to you know, cure homelessness in Austin, and they've built a place, and they've got 150 people off the street, and there's 1,000 chronically homeless people. I know a guy that's trying to uh, help build out the uh, NICU wing in a, in a hospital in Austin, the Dell Children's Hospital, and make sure that underserved families have a place if their kids are born premature or have issues where they can have the top quality in the world for nothing. And they built one of the best NICU places in, in, in the United States of America. So, so the people I know, I know a person who's obsessed with building water wells in, in Ethiopia and putting in schools and putting in hospitals and spent like they got a $300 million payout and they put a half of their money immediately into a charity to solve this problem. And, and the people I know that are wealthy are really up to big, big things and they're doing everything they can to make a difference and not in the way a government agency would like people actually on the ground caring, making sure every dollar counts. Um, but I think, you know, that's one side of the story. That's my experience. The other side is, you know, Y2K. I mean, sorry, Y2K is uh, what the big crash we just had, the Great Recession. Uh, that movie, what was it called? Uh, Boomerang or the one that just was on the the big short. Yep. And, and, and all, they, those guys look like a bunch of jerks just trying to get rich at our expense. And I, I is there both sides? I don't know, man. I really don't. Maybe – Maybe guys that make money in their 20s and 30s, which haven't really fully matured as a human, maybe some of that goes on, you know. Um, but my experience, you know, and maybe it's more common in New York or different places, big centers of money. But my experience of wealthy people is, you know, I haven't yet met one that hasn't got a cause that they're committed to. And a lot of them really, it becomes almost the majority of their work time or it's at least equal. So they're, no, they're making money, but they're also giving a huge amount of time to whether it's homelessness or water wells in Ethiopia or different things. And I think that's the, really the pure journey. Like if you want to have the true journey of life, you grind it out, you build wealth, you have success, you manifest becoming a great business person. Maybe that's being the lion like you, you, you know, on your podcast. Yeah, that's the part where you're just – you got it figured out and it's rolling. But then I think as you get older, it's like, okay, where can I make a difference? Where can I give back? You begin to realize you're not going to be here forever. Life is more uh, you know, temporal and you're like, how could I really make a difference? You got all your economic needs in the mitt. So it's like what cause could I take on where I can change the world? And I think most people I meet go through that evolution, and I think that's the ultimate evolution of being a human being from grinding for self-sufficiency to winning beyond your means to abundance and then from abundance to contribution. David, I just want to say this interview has been excellent so far, and now we're going to enter the lines around where I'm just going to ask you a couple of quick questions before we end the show today. Okay. What, what would you say to someone who's just starting out and going after their dreams? I'd say choose a thing that you enjoy doing. Understand when people say, you know, I love my job, I'm passionate. There's everybody that loves their job had some days where they didn't love it but went up and get after it anyway. So choose something that works for you, that's, that's a match for you, and then just get after it and get after it hard. Grind it out. Don't question yourself too much. Don't overthink things. Just choose something and give it a go. And if you're like, well, I, you know, once you choose something, you lose other options in life. That's just the nature of the beast. So if you become a doctor, you can't necessarily be a lawyer. If you become a lawyer, you probably can't be a salesperson. If you build a computer company, you probably also can't build a landscaping company. But don't remain in that unchosen spot where you're like, oh, I could do anything, but you're really doing nothing. Pick something and grinding out, grind it out. And if you think to yourself, I don't want to be trapped there, well, then Call it like enlisting in the army. Say, okay, for four years, I'm going to enlist in this, like sales. 
and I'm going to grind it out as best as I can for the four years. And every, if you're having failure and you're having doubts and you hear that voice that says, you should do something different, say, yeah, but I enlisted for four years. Because success means getting into it and getting past the enthusiasm into the grind and then making it through the other side into success. And if you keep quitting every time you run out of enthusiasm, uh, you'll actually never succeed, in my opinion, at a deep, deep level in anything. You'll just flitter from opportunity to opportunity. So pick something that you like that's kind of met matched to who you are and then just get after it and get after it hard. Do you happen to have two or three books that you recommend for our audience to read? Well, my favorite book of all time is As a Man Thinketh. I think someone wrote As a Woman Thinketh also, so it's kind of the same concept, which is just basically your thoughts is your garden, so manage your garden, pull out the weak thoughts, pull out the thoughts that don't serve you, and uh, and then build on the thoughts that do. It's like that old Indian proverb, there are, there are two wolves in you, one, one is good and strong and noble, and one is full of hatred and jealousy. And the young boy asked the, the, the Indian which one, which one wins in the fight because they're fighting constantly. And, and, and the, the old wise guy says, whichever one you feed. So I think it's the same is true of your mind. You have to feed the positive, empowering thoughts and sort of ignore the weaker, more negative thoughts. And if you'll do that over time, you'll end up developing a very strong mind. So as a man thinketh is one, obviously think and grow rich is another. And I strongly recommend everyone read Wealth Can't Wait. It was just written. It's coming out in April. And it's an amazing book. And David, last question of the day. Where can our audience find you? DavidOsborne.com is uh, the easiest place to find me. That's O-S-B-O-R-N.com. David at DavidOsborne.com is my website. So that would be the best way to reach me, Trevor. And David, I'd just like to say thank you so much for taking the time today to speak with our audience. It's my pleasure. I hope everyone's dreams come true. That's my only wish for everyone. Thanks for listening to Become the Lion. Everything from today's show will be in our show notes on our website. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. Till next week, don't stop grinding.